Welcome back. Very good. So in the first part of the session, we did a little bit of an overview. And now we're going to take a few specific examples of some of the sacred texts and talk about how they can impact our perspective, our teaching, uh, the tools that it provides us in a class, the questions that it raises that our students are probably already asking themselves without ever even having heard of a particular scripture or writing. And we're going to start with the Nasadiya Sukta. And so I've given you the text for this beautiful writing. It is the 129th Sukta of the Ten Mandala of the Rig Veda. So this is the story of creation that comes from the Rig Veda. Bless you. And it's called Not the Non-Existent. Then even nothingness was not, nor existence. There was no air then, nor the heavens beyond it. What was covered? Where was it? In whose keeping? Was there then cosmic water in depths unfathomed? Then there was neither death nor immortality, nor was there then the torch of night and day. The one breathed windlessly and self-sustaining. There was that one then, and then there was no other. At first there was only darkness wrapped in darkness. All this was only unillumined water, that one which came to be, enclosed in nothing, arose at last, born of the power of heat. In the beginning, desire descended on it. That was the primal seed born of the mind. The sages who have searched their hearts with wisdom know that which is kin to that which is not. And they have stretched their cord across the void and know what was above and what was below. Seminal powers made fertile mighty forces, below was strength and over impulse. But after all, who knows and who can say whence it all came and how creation happened? The gods themselves are later than creation. So who knows truly whence it has arisen? Whence all creation had its origin, he, whether he fashioned it or whether he did not, he who surveys it all from the highest heaven, he knows, or maybe even he does not. So a beautiful writing out of the Rig Veda. And I would suggest that you read it a few times. But I'll give you a couple of ideas about how you might look at it as you're reading it. And the first is that it places a definitive importance on rational thinking and inquiry. To ask questions. To not blindly follow. To not accept anything that I'm saying or anything that anybody else is saying as being the truth because it might not be it might not hold validity for you the more learned or skillful a person is in their spiritual endeavors once you get to the level of guru or saint or rishi those words you can hear as truth because they've acquired something that you and I are still working on. They've acquired an undisturbed mind. When a mind is disturbed, it's not rational. When a mind is disturbed, it doesn't ask the appropriate questions. When a mind is disturbed, it says, how come I can't do this posture as well as she can? Does the teacher like me? Does that teacher not like me? I really like her mat. I think I'm going to go out and buy one later. <laughs> right? These are not rational thoughts. <laughs> you 
You wouldn't find a rishi saying that. <laughs> and a guru might say, that's a very lovely mat. But that would be for your benefit, not for theirs. The disturbed mind is always looking to validate itself on some level. The undisturbed mind is always looking to end suffering. So the first thing that this beautiful writing teaches us is the importance of rational thinking and inquiry, of not giving our thoughts more validity than they deserve. When we are rationally thinking, we should recognize it, be okay with it, accept it. When we're not rationally thinking, we should acknowledge it and not follow it. The second is the consistency of the laws of nature. And this is an absolutely beautiful and amazing conversation. The consistency of the laws of nature. There's really only one consistency, <coughs> change. The seasons change, even in areas of the world where they don't seem to have seasons. There are still seasons. The stars, the planets, the sun, the moon, they're always changing. Little bits being gathered, little bits being tossed off. The air, the fire, the earth, the water, this, this, the ethers are always changing. Inside of you, inside of me, the composition of elements that make up our being, what in Ayurveda we call the doshas or the constitution, is always changing. Always changing. So the most consistent law of nature is change. But our highly irrational minds say, I don't like that. I want things to stay the same. I want to know that tomorrow will be exactly as it is today. I wouldn't mind if Wednesday was a little different. <laughs> but at least today and tomorrow should be pretty much the same. Once we come to understand that the consistency in the laws of nature, the consistency of three things, creation, maintenance, and destruction, birth, life, and death, being, existing, and not being, that these three principles of the laws of nature are always happening then we can alleviate ourselves of the struggle of certain questions <clears throat> like how will I ever change? You already are. When will I get to the goal? There isn't one. There's only one. But other than that, there isn't one. <laughs> or we might look and say why do I keep repeating the same thing over and over and over again when I know how much pain it causes me, when I know that it's going to bring me suffering? Why do I keep doing this? Birth, life, death. Creation, maintenance, destruction. You'll keep repeating the same pattern until you repeat another one, until you make the active choice to let the next birth be different. And even though it seems like we're repeating, it's really not always the same because it's a different level of suffering each time. So let's just say the person who drinks too much. They say, you know, every Friday I go out and I get drunk. And then I get sick. And then I wake up with a headache. And then I swear, next Friday, I'm not doing this. And next Friday, where are they? At 6 o'clock. They're at happy hour. And they do the same thing. And they get sick again. And then they wake up with a headache. And they're not doing this again. But they keep doing it over and over again. Each time that they repeat that, the suffering goes deeper into their being. The guilt goes deeper into their being. The rationality escapes them more and more. And pretty soon, there's no need for even an excuse. Now they're not only going on Friday, but they're going on Saturday too. 
the only way that that cycle will change, even though it is changing in and of itself, but the way that that cycle of harm changes is when the mind changes, is when they take active measures to shift their patterns, their habitual ways of behaving. So instead of going to TGI Fridays, you know, they go to the movies. Gotta start somewhere, right? Make it a nonviolent film. <laughs> so we have this beautiful consistency in the laws of nature. The primary law of nature is change. Change is always happening to us. Goals are not really valid, except for one, because things are always changing. And change can either deepen our suffering or it can alleviate our suffering, depending upon how we are depending on our habitual behaviors, how we're letting them manifest in our experience. So let's say you have a student and the student has been working on some posture or, or on meditation. They come to you and they say, your meditation is like no one else's. I have never had such a great experience in meditation. I come to your class, I sit down, my mind is blank. I'm good, I could stay there forever. And they tell you this for three weeks. Fourth week, they come in, they say, what's going on? Oh my gosh, my mind is so crazy. What happened? I had it and now I've lost it. And this is just, this mustn't work or there's something wrong with me or, 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 or. And as a teacher, the most functional thing that you can tell the student is just like nature, you are always changing. You are setting yourself up for disappointment if you expect to have the same experience every single time that you sit in meditation, that you take a posture, you are setting yourself up for great disappointment. But it was so good the first three weeks. I really liked it. And I don't like it when my mind is a little haywire. But can you find something about the shifting back and forth, about the play, about the, the change that holds potential. Can you recognize that actually sometimes when the mind is disturbed, it's an invitation to re-experience peace. So let's just say that peace was chocolate. Any chocolate fans in the room? <laughs> yeah. So peace is chocolate. And you have peace every day for breakfast, for lunch, and dinner. And snacks in between. First time you sit down to that plate of peace, that chocolate's going to be so good. You're going to be like, oh my gosh, I am just the, the most fortunate person in the world. My piece is made of chocolate. Oh, and you have that chocolate and you eat that chocolate and it's wonderful. And then lunch. And it's still really good. Because now you're having Belgian chocolate, you know. And then late afternoon snack. And it's still really good. And dinner. And it's still good. And breakfast. And it's okay. <laughs> It's losing a little bit of its appeal. It's not losing its appeal. You are forgetting its appeal. And because we're humans that get stuck in this pattern of forgetting, when we are in the midst of change, it's an opportunity to once again remember. Now, of course, peace is not chocolate. And, and, and when you are in that state of spiritual bliss, of peace, you don't, you know, the, uh, hopefully the tendency is you don't get bored, you know. Um, but 
given that we abide in the laws of nature and the way things are constantly fluctuating and changing, instead of becoming frustrated and overwhelmed by that change, we can look at that change as an opportunity to seek peace on purpose, study on purpose, practice compassion and service on purpose, and constantly bring ourselves back to a state of remembrance on purpose. We will often say, when am I going to experience this? When am I going to experience enlightenment? When? When you decide to. That's when. When you choose to no longer forget. When you choose to remember. And in order to remember, you have to allow a level of creativity. Because that's what pulls you out of the constriction of doubt and hopelessness and puts you into a place of empowerment, creativity. Yeah. And the power of opposites is the other thing that um, the Nasadiya Sukta shares with us, this power of opposites that dark and night, dar I'm sorry, dark and light and good and bad and here and gone they're powerful. They're powerful, powerful preferences. And those preferences, those opposites, only exist because we do. You know that old saying, if nobody was there to hear it, would a tree falling in the forest make a noise? <laughs> That's a good question. If humans weren't here, would there be opposites day and night or would there only be like cycles of change because it's not dark than light is it no there's a whole dawn and a whole dusk and so really these opposites that we get so carried away with are not actually opposite of one another they're parts of a cycle that is always changing and if we can allow ourselves to be with that change as it's happening, then what we find is that balance becomes very accessible to us. Because if you walked, let's just say this room was pitch black and the sun outside was bright. If you walked from in here, out there, would it hurt your eyes? You'd probably throw your hands over your eyes and be like, oh man, it's just, too bright out here. Somebody turn down the light. If you walked from outside to in here and it was pitch dark in here, you wouldn't, you would be shocked also on some level. You would have a state of fight or flight because you can't see anything. But when you go gradually, there's less shock to your system. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when you see that your student is challenged in a posture, you know, they're working on a warrior three pose, a balanced posture. Or they're working on, they're working on relaxing. You can always suggest to them to practice gradually instead of expecting everything to be perfect the first time out. So when I say practice gradually, I'll use tree pose as an example. When some people practice tree pose, what they do is they stand in Tadasana or something like that and they hike one foot all the way up close to the groin and throw their arms up in the air. That's like walking from a brightly lit room into a pitch black room. So the gradual process would be to stand in Tadasana, mountain pose, aligned feet grounded and parallel, creating stability in yourself and in your stance. And then once that stability is there, your faith has now deepened, your doubt has lessened, and you're more stable because of that, because the mind is less disturbed when the body feels stable. So now you turn one foot out and you place only the, the heel on the ankle. 
and you leave the toes on the floor. So now you're in a modified tree pose. There's still a great level of stability. There might be a little bit of shakiness, but at least it's like, you know, you're getting your night vision, right? You're like waiting to focus. You're allowing yourself that time to restabilize, to come from a place of stability and not a place of just got to get it done. And then once you feel stable there, there's an invitation. And when that invitation comes, if it comes, then you lift the foot a little higher to the inside of the shin below the knee. And you work there because there is no goal. What is tree pose? You know, I mean, is there such a thing? Is it ever finished? Is it ever one thing? So if you acquire balance there and stability there, then you lift the foot higher and you see what happens. And then you start making compassionate decisions. Well, if I'm too unstable here and I'm not breathing and I'm constricting my muscles too much, then maybe I put my foot down a little further. Or maybe I even come all the way out of the posture. But if I feel strong and stable and I feel like I can breathe well and I'm focused, then I'll stay. And in that way, the process is gradual. It's like this beautiful cycle. So I'm oftentimes known for saying, a posture is not a stagnant moment in time. A posture is a process where you start with an awareness of the level of peacefulness that you're carrying in your body and mind. And you're moving through a bunch of moments working or allowing or empowering yourself to maintain that peace until you get to another place. So start from a place of peace, maintain the place of peace, and when it's time to shift, shift peacefully. But if you get into that tree pose and you're like, ah! and all of a sudden everything just got real tight and rigid, that's not peace that won't cause you to experience yoga because yoga is the experience of inner peace which brings about a sense of union with the divine whatever name you call that if you're not peaceful then you're the opposite of peaceful peace is expansive rigidity is not to become vulnerable to your own level of devotion your own sense of devotion there needs to be vulnerability. There needs to be space for that. Rigidity doesn't give space. Does that make sense? Yeah. So here's a couple of things that we can ask our students, and I won't go through the whole list, but just one or two. Um, you know, you could read that beautiful writing at the beginning of class, or a portion of it. And you could say, you know, in light of this, this this scripture, in light of this sacred writing, while you're practicing today, contemplate what is a practice? What is a sadhana? What is a spiritual practice? And what is not a practice? What is a practice and what is not a practice? And initially, you'll, you may have some students actually answer you and they might say, well, you know, the practice is what I do on my yoga mat, you know? I get up every morning at 6 o'clock, I get on my yoga mat, I do 10 sun salutations, a couple of other postures, breathe a little, sit in meditation, you know, get up and get my coffee. Oh, getting your coffee is not part of your spiritual practice? No, so I'm getting coffee. What does that have to do with spiritual practice? It has everything to do with spiritual practice. How can you see putting yourself into a bunch of contorted postures, as sacred and not see the cup of coffee that you are putting into your body and assimilating into your being as sacred. What is a sadhana? What is a spiritual practice? What is resistance? That's a good question. What is resistance? And what does resistance lead to? When we're resistant, it leads to excuses. 
It leads to blame. It leads to harm. But resistance can sometimes be necessary too, and it should be listened to when it's necessary. So for example, if you're working in a posture where you're trying to put your foot behind your head and you're getting a lot of resistance in your hip, maybe don't force. (laughs) Otherwise, maybe you won't be able to do that part of your sadhana any longer for a while, you know? But what's today's tendency? Today's tendency is that people will force. To get the foot there is the goal. They don't care how. This is a teaching in Western society, right? The ends justify the means? Do they really? Even if the means are harmful? Do the ends justify that? That's not peaceful. What's far more important than acquiring a certain posture in your body you know, as far as a physical practice goes, is the level of peace with which you exist in any moment, whether you're in that posture or not. Now, Swami Shivananda said, he said, a yogi, a, a practiced yogi should be able to sit in a posture for three hours, relaxed, comfortable, joyful, without ever once wanting to get out. Three hours and not fall asleep (laughs) and not drop the head and not be bored. Three hours. Yeah. So we have a little work set out for us, you know. Should you be able to be in every posture for three hours? No, absolutely not. Because every posture is not appropriate for you. Every posture is not appropriate for me. But one posture, yes. Which one is the most fertile, do you think? To try, to work toward, to build resiliency in. Would it be headstand, shoulder stand, peacock pose, meditation? Meditation. Because when Patanjali talked about yoga, he didn't talk about headstand or shoulder stand or peacock pose. He talked about sitting with your legs crossed and your spine tall and your eyes closed and your mind free. So the three hours of sitting would be potentially in meditation. And when you look at the yoga asana, so you know Patanjali's Eightfold Path, right? Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi. He put them in that order for you know, a little bit of a reason, right? Asana doesn't come first. It's not primary. Asana's purpose is to keep you healthy, to keep the energetic channels in your body open to a degree so that you're circulating not just blood and lymph and interstitial fluids, but so that you're also circulating prana, life force, so that you are healthy enough to sit in meditation for longer and longer and longer periods of time without fidgeting, without wanting to get out, without worrying about, what time is it? Is it time to go yet? Have I reached enlightenment? What is surrender? So I'll tell you a little story. So I had a student who came to me and she said, she was upset. She said, Suda, I don't know. I have to do this project and, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it on surrender and I, I'm trying to surrender. I'm, I'm having that be my life intention for the next three months and I'm getting irritated. Every time I try to surrender, It's just so irritating. And she went on. And at the end of of what she was saying to me, I just asked her one question. I said, what is surrender? And she said, what? She was irritated. What? I said, what is surrender? 
And she said, well, it's surrender. I said, no, surrender is a word. What is it? What are you looking to do? What does surrender mean to you? What are you applying it to? How are you applying it? I, said, I don't know. I said, well, then start doing some research. When you go home, open up the dictionary, look it up online, look it up in an encyclopedia, ask your friends, whatever. Write down every single definition that you can of this word surrender. And then look at it. And ask yourself, what am I doing? What does this mean? And then you'll be moving from a place of understanding and not from a place of impulse. Surrender. It's a, it's a sexy, sexy word these days. <laughs> you know? But what does it mean? And unless we start from a place of at least a little bit of understanding of what it means and what it might require of us in order to accomplish it, then we're going to set ourselves up for disappointment, which is going to deepen our suffering, which is going to disturb our mind, which is going to lead to harmful acts, which is going to lead to guilt, which is going to take us away from our spiritual practice because then we won't feel worthy. And then our deepening, our suffering will deepen. And then our mind will become more disturbed. <laughs> See? Like, yeah, pretty wicked cycle. Yeah. So, what is surrender? What is investigation? These are all things to consider. What is happiness? My goodness. What is happiness? If we go to the next page, we start with the Upanishad. There are a couple of primary teachings that run through most of the Upanishads. And the first is that truth can only be known through faith and not through the thinking mind. Truth can only be known through faith and not through the thinking mind. Because really, I can sit here and look out that window and I can say to myself, well, it must be fall because the leaves have fallen off the trees. But not all the leaves are off the trees. So that kind of makes me doubt myself a little bit. The grass has lost its green color, but not all the grass has lost its green color. It's just shifted shades, you know. So the mind will query, it'll ask a question, then it'll answer itself. And the answer that it gives itself will most often times negate the answer that it gave itself before, but if, coulda, shoulda, woulda, it gets caught up in these things. Faith is a matter of not getting caught up in those things. You don't get caught up in doubt, hopelessness. You simply see clearly that it's harmless or not harming. that it supports you in being a more peaceful person, even if at moments you're not. Because yoga is not, it's not, you know, the yoga techniques, we're human. It's not about some elevated level of perfection, like I always have to be peaceful. I'm not always peaceful. Just ask my husband. <laughs> but as my practice continues, I have more peaceful moments than not peaceful moments. And when I'm not peaceful, it's shorter periods of time that it lasts. So there's more resiliency. And that deepens faith that this path is correct because it leads me to be a more peaceful person, a more compassionate person. If I go around saying, I hate, I hate, I hate, I that's not, that's not health, wellness, happiness. That's harm. So truth can only be known through faith. Faith can be found in what allows you 
or faith is what allows you to feel peaceful more often. Faith is found in surrender as well. Faith is resiliency. Faith is what allows us to say, I know this works because it worked for me. It alleviated my suffering to some degree. And then faith becomes devotion to whatever it is, again, that you're devoted to. Because nothing is ever random except everything. <laughs> okay, never mind, that's a different conversation. Um, but, you know, on the spiritual level, nothing is ever random. Every gift that we ever receive, we receive from one source and one source only. And so everything we ever receive is for the purpose of us moving along this spiritual path in finding ourself, awakening to ourself, and supporting the alleviation of suffering of all other beings. The essence of the divine exists in each and every one of us, without exception. Sorry. That means that that pain in the butt neighbor that you have, or that politician that you don't like, or anybody and everybody. If, if we say, as yoga teachers, namaste. Namaste means, generally, the light in me honors and acknowledges the light in you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you. But maybe not that one over there. <laughs> because I love this little cartoon. It's a woman sitting in meditation, and she's got a little thought bubble over her head. And she goes, my light is so bright. My meditation is so good. Her light, rather dim. <laughs> And every time I think of that cartoon, I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> when we say that the divine energy has manifest its essence in everything, we mean everything without exception. The only reason why it looks like it might not be there is because we humans have this wonderful little thing called an ego. And the ego says, no, it's not. You're better than they are. You're worse than they are. You're different than they are. You're special, they're not. You're not special, they are. The ego plays this little game that causes us to doubt our own knowing, to doubt our own faith. Now, the entire ego is not a bad thing. The ego is necessary, right? The ego is necessary. It causes you to want to live, which is a good thing. Because the longer you live, the more karma you resolve, the better death you'll have, for lack of an easier way to put it, sorry. And then the more favorable rebirth you'll have. Now, you can look at that as reincarnation lifetime to lifetime or you can look at it as reincarnation this moment to the next for example if i befriend someone today and i betray them and then i befriend someone tomorrow and i betray them and then i befriend someone the next day and i betray them and then I die. I will not have an opportunity in this life to befriend someone and not betray them. And it's important that we do. It's important that we have every opportunity in this life to awaken to our own compassion, our own forgiveness, our own love, our own potential rather than staying caught in the samskaric cycles or the behavioral patterns of harm. And so acknowledging the existence of the divine in every single thing 
everywhere. And allowing that to extend even to the people we don't like and the things we don't like, that allows us in the next moment to have this other experience. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. We do not need to fear dying because our true self is immortal. You know, our true self, not our physical self. Of course, this body is going to go someday. It has to. Everything that's biological has to go. That's part of this birth, maintenance, death thing. You know, it's not fun to talk about, but it's real and it happens. You know, but, but, but this body isn't me because I can look at it. That's my hand. If it belongs to me, it's not me. My car, my house, my friend, my husband. These things I feel, might feel, they belong to me, but they're not me. They're things I associate with, you know? And the body is the same thing, my body. Whose body? My real self, my true self, your true self. What is that? Consciousness. Consciousness. So, you know, when you were three years old, you had a certain body. You're probably like every other three year old, right? Just learning how to toilet train and running around and getting into all kinds of stuff, right? When you were 12 years old, you had a different body. But your mind was the same, wasn't it? You still experienced your life through your body. You're 30 years old, now you have a different body. You're 50, you have a different body. But you are the same. The essence of you. Yes, you've matured egoically and you have adopted patterns of behavior, but you are the same. The one who sees outside of these eyes is the same. Yeah. And then bhakti is the prime path for self-realization and lasting happiness. It's also the primary path for um, embracing the practice of not harming. It's the primary path of recognizing the divine light that exists in all beings everywhere. Bhakti is devotion. Bhakti is divine love. Bhakti is a personal dedication to God consciousness. Is that, a, is that like a bad word? You, you know what I'm saying? Like in, in today's society, like God is a bad word, you know? Could you ever even imagine that? Yeah, right? People can curse all they want on TV, but they can't say God. <laughs> yeah, exactly, you know? But God consciousness is the whole point of being alive. Because when we are not in a state of communion with the divine, and by God I'm not saying male or female, I'm using that as just a term. When we're not in a state of communion with that source, then we're suffering. So life is either suffering or communion. That's the choice we make. Bhakti is the path to unity. It's the path to consciousness. The Isha or Ishavasya Upanishad of the Yajurveda teaches non-dualism, which is called Aidveta, that God or Brahman is the essential inhabitant of every single thing that exists. The Manduka Upanishad states, not through talking, intellect, or even study of the scriptures can the true self be realized. The true self reveals itself to the one who surrenders to it longs for it and abides in its reality. Those who know the self become the self, freed from the fetters of separateness, they attain to immortality. The Upanishad teaches that bhakti has three components, longing, love, and life. There is a longing in the heart, a spiritual impulse, the impulse to know oneself. Love is the vehicle, and life is the expression. 
This passage comes from the Upanishads. From the unreal, lead me to the real. From darkness to light, and from death, lead me to immortality. The Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. And on process, the process of becoming infused with bhakti or infused with devotion, the Upanishads share, seek not the truth by abandoning this world. Seek not the truth by abandoning this world. You're here whether you want to be or not. So, seek not the truth by abandoning this world or by renouncing your duties. This is not the path of salvation. Rather, desire to live a full life of a hundred years, actively engaged in selfless service and divine love. This is the only way to attain freedom. The opposite will not realize freedom, only further suffering. Ishavasya Upanishad. Now, before we take our next break, if you go to the next page, I've given you a list of mantras that are ideal for meditation. These come from the Upanishads, and they're also found in other texts. There are several of them that you might read in the Bhagavad Gita. There are several of them that are included in other texts as well. But these are simple statements that when they're meditated upon, the vibration of the sound of the Sanskrit words resonates with something even deeper than the molecular structure of the person. English has sound, right? Any word. And it has a certain vibrational quality to it. Sanskrit also has a vibrational quality. And it's thought by many that that vibrational quality is immensely greater than English or French or Spanish or any other language. Because English was written down by people. They made some figures and they made some sounds and they put them together and sometimes it makes sense and sometimes it doesn't. Sanskrit was not created by people. It is thought that Sanskrit was sent down from the divine so that there would be a method to communicate through resonance, through vibration, with the source from which we came. So, Aham Brahamsi, I am Brahma. I am Atma Brahma. The self is Brahman. Tatvamasi, that art thou. Prajna nam Brahma, knowledge is Brahman. Sarvam Kalvidam Brahma, the whole universe is Brahman. Soham, I am that. And there's a little explanation there, but let's just talk about that word Brahman for a moment. It is universal consciousness the source, supreme intelligence, God, I am that. Not that I, this little human who has a weird ego that's sometimes balanced and sometimes not balanced, you know, that, that, that being, that part of me is, you know, just human. But the light that's inside, the light that causes us to thrive, the light that, that recognizes the value of love and, and the beauty of peace, that light comes only from that. Because my ego is entirely too fluctuating to ever have done something that beautiful. <laughs> so, so we will stop there. I'll give you a moment to um, ask any questions before we take a 10 minute break. Does anybody have any questions or comments that they'd like to make? Yes. So, on the subject of resistance and practice, 
when I was younger and meditating, when I would have a particularly awful meditation where I was very distracted, I used to think that I had to push through that in order to create habit, even though it was horrible, and that you know, you're suffering during it. Now that I'm getting older, I'm just stopping. Is, is there a value in sticking with practice that is that you do feel resistance around, or should you just stop? Like what, what, what is the preferential yeah. way to do that? There's definitely a benefit. Um, there's a benefit to some people to stick with it. So a habit takes 27 days to create. Typically, they'll say that if you do something 27 days in a row, on the 28th day, it's now a habit. I think it's a little more complicated than that. But And the ego is going to resist the meditation. The ego is going to resist the stillness because it wants drama. You know, it wants to do something. It wants headlines. You know, not not little tiny uh, moments. It wants big flashes of amazingness and something to keep it distracted and busy. And so, to tame the ego, on the one hand, you need something powerful, and and will and determination are powerful. They're powerful combatants, and they can meet the ego and they can overwhelm the ego, and they can quash the ego. But the thing that we have to be really mindful about is that in, in quelling the ego, we're not harming it. Because we all already walk around with enough egoic injuries to last us several thousand lifetimes. So, so there, there needs to be a compassion there as well. So yes, sit. But don't sit in anger, because anger is constricting. Sit in love and trick the ego. You know, when I, earlier in my, my meditations, I would talk to my ego and, and my mind and I would just say, you know, you're so smart. <laughs> and it's going to sound a little, little out there, but I would say to my ego, you're so smart. Can you be a good teacher for me? Can you, can you be an amazing teacher and teach me how to do this? That would just mean the world to me, you know? And I don't know if it would work for you, but it worked for me. And on the days when that didn't work, then I talked to my mind like it was my child, you know? Mom, <laughs> you know, pulling on you and saying, can I have candy? You know, and I just say, now is not the time for the conversation, but I promise we will have it. So give me 10 minutes and then I'll give you time. And between those two, it always tended to work itself out one way or another. So, and, and practicing those two does require that will, that determination. But then there's this other side to it. And, and it gets a little, a little uh, bless you, esoteric or a little uh, complicated, but, but basically the only thing that's stopping you is you. The only one who's keeping that battle emblazoned is you. The only one who's causing the resistance is you. Therefore, you're the problem. So, change. Just change. Surrender. What does that mean? Oh. That's another hour. <laughs> That's a great question though. Yeah. So, so again, just to recap on that a little bit. So when you're finding that meditation or anything that you're doing, you hit a plateau or, or it's, it's just downright uncomfortable. You know, we don't really want to bring pain into the body. We already have enough of it. Our yoga practice should not cause pain in our body, but discomfort's a good teacher. So if a posture or a practice causes discomfort, then work to sit with it and understand why. What tendencies do you have that you're bringing to the table that enhance that discomfort or alleviate it? And in that way, you become resilient. And then your, your, your meditation becomes something else. Yeah. But don't walk away from it. Don't walk away from it because when you least expect it, you'll start seeing flowers and colors and all kinds of amazing things. And they don't mean anything. 
<laughs> but they're pretty to look at. <laughs> Any other thoughts? No? Okay, 10-minute break, and then we'll come back for the third part. Thank you.